This week, Maggie and I are getting married. And so we're really busy and we're really excited and we're just really happy to announce this. And so as we're getting ready for our wedding, which we are going to hold right here in our gardens, a potluck wedding with straw bale seating and food that we're going to serve from the gardens. And so we're really excited and we're getting all ready and all set. So this week's video is not a ton of editing, put together all sorts of stuff that's going on in the garden in July and uh, a bunch of harvesting, some different tips and tricks and uh, updates and stuff of what's going on. So I uh, hope you enjoy the, the video and let's get started. Our first nasturtiums of the season for the kitchen. Mild spicy flavor. Beautiful color in the salad. Nasturtium is a great companion plant to have, but only for certain plants. Let me first tell you a little bit about nasturtium. So, the flower is beautiful, beautiful vibrant colors of red, yellow and orange. It's edible, a little bit spicy, garlicky spicy. And not only the flowers are edible, also the leaves are edible as well. They're also kind of garlicky spicy type of garlic. You know, flavor. Now, these here are being companions to the pole beans that are growing on the fence behind me here. You can see they're going up the fence. And so these nasturtiums are being companion plants to those beans because sometimes the little animals like to come after the beans, but these nasturtiums are forming a wall uh, against those beans. And um, and, and so keeping the animals away. Also, what's growing right beside the nasturtium is a little bit of wild mint, which uh, we didn't plant, but it's really wonderful because it smells like mint. It's a wonderful, delicious smell. It's edible too. And, uh, and, and it's just growing alongside the nasturtium. And, and I say that's good too, because the thing about nasturtium is you can't use it as a companion plant to just any plant. Why? Because it grows really fast and gets really big and takes up a lot of space. And so in the past when I, you know, when I was a bit newer to nasturtium, I ended up uh, choking out uh, the plants that it was supposed to be uh, do, being a companion plant for. However, bull beans are one of the fastest growing plants there are. And uh, because they're growing up against the fence and not up poles and stuff like that, you know, I'd planted them a little bit away from the fence so they'd get a bit more sunlight. And so then they had to start looking for trying to find the fence. And rather than me always trying to direct those, uh, those vines up, as soon as the beans started to grow, that's when I sowed the seeds of the nasturtium. I sowed the beans first, just direct seeded them. And then when the beans started to grow, that's when I sowed the nasturtium. So they took a bit of time to, to, uh, to uh, germinate as well. And then as soon as they germinated and they started to grow, well, the beans were already starting to vine, but they were, the vines were kind of going every which way. But because the nasturtiums are in front of the beans, so the beans are between the nasturtiums and the fence, then they, they kind of pushed the, the bean vines up against the fence and helped them actually find the fence, which is really nice. So we got now, we got these tall, these nasturtiums, which are quite, look at how high they come. That's like uh, almost, uh, almost a meter high, three, three feet tall, these nasturtiums. But then behind them, you got the beans growing in abundance. And then they're framed by this wild mint. I've also got wild mint right here too. And I've got a little bit of watermelon growing and some wormwood over here, some jewelweed over there. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, as usual, lots of biodiversity here. Very beautiful, edible flower, edible leaf, and a great companion plant for anything that grows tall and quickly. If you've got fencing surrounding your garden, use it to 
grow your cucumbers. They love to have extra sunlight. They love to climb. And the little spacing, these are two by three spacings. Uh, it's three inches tall or two wide, or if I put it in the other direction, then two, two tall and three wide. You can get rolls of this stuff. You can buy rolls of it, you know, at different, different lengths for different prices, different thicknesses of the wire. You can cut it up using a regular, well, maybe not this size garden shear, but maybe something a little bit stronger than this. You can cut them into pieces, use uh, just regular scrap wood to make fencing with it or to make trellises with it for your cucumbers to grow. And then when they get that vertical space to grow on, they just love it. And as I've said before, the uh, vertical space, the birds love it too. The cucumbers just love this vertical spacing because it just gives them a lot of sunlight. And also they can use both sides of the spacing. Got one on the other side here. Let's see if I can get at it. There we go. Nice one. And I see one on the ground here. On the ground they're good too, but they, they get a bit dirty, but no big deal. What else is going on? I've got some watermelon growing here too. I got one right there hanging right there. As it gets bigger, I'm going to have to maybe put a sock around it, hold it in place so it doesn't fall. There's another one over there, late July. There we go. Anybody else? Cucumbers often get away from me because they like to hide. Got a bit of okra right here. I love okra, it's such a pretty plant. So, here's another one. This is the south side of the garden. They get the south light, they get the east, the west, everything. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nice little cucumber harvest for late, late July. And we got a little broccoli harvest. Most of my broccoli have already harvested it. But let's harvest this, this one. I'm gonna get it low on the vine, low on the branch because, there we are. So, here we go. Here's the broccoli. I've got a ton of stem, why? Because here at this part of the stem, it hasn't split open. But if I had cut it higher up, there would have been a hole in it and that hole would have encouraged growth of stuff. But if you look down here, you see some branches growing. See that little white thing right there? That's, that's where I cut the stem and there's no hole in there, but there are these other stems growing here and there's a leaf here and a couple more stems. All these stems are gonna grow more little mini broccolis uh, that I can either harvest or let them go to seed. But if I had cut higher up on the stem, there would have been a hole there would have been a hole right here in the middle and bugs would have gone in there and started eating it. But now this, this, this little cut section can dry up in the sun, hopefully. And uh, then the plant will be able to continue to grow successfully. There's a watermelon behind it. Now the broccoli's all ready. Oops. Now the broccoli's all ready in the kitchen, sitting in a bowl full of water. I've cut the, already cut the leaves and the, the leaves are ready to be used as kale, like they were kale, or maybe we can ferment them like they were cabbage. And the broccoli's all, all set too, for some good meals. Here's the amaranth, amaranth starting to flower. There, you can see, uh, right there is where I harvested. This had a much thinner, head to it a much thinner like head stem so i guess this must have been a smaller type of broccoli i know i had two types one that does this kind of thing gives you a slightly smaller head but i like this much better because the other one has such a thick stem on top that it splits when you harvest the the, the broccoli and then it it's prone to bugs whereas this one see how that's dried up nicely hold on See there how that's dried up really nicely. And so now these little mini broccoli heads that I could harvest to eat are doing really well. But I'm gonna actually let them continue until they flower 
so I can collect some broccoli seeds because I don't have any homegrown broccoli seeds and that's something I really like. So it's official, the Three Sisters demonstration garden is now completely full. The sorghum is taller than me now, it hasn't even, but it hasn't even gotten to full size yet. The pumpkin and squash have completely filled this garden. It's important to hold on to the, all that ancient wisdom. And it's completely surrounded by sorghum. And in the middle, the, the three sisters here. So in the middle, you got the beans and the corn and surrounding them, all this squash. And it's even on the outside too. Squash is growing on the outside as well, on the outside of all the sorghum. And we're here in the middle of the forest. This is just a little circle cut out in the middle of the forest. Well, it's not cut out because there was nothing here before. It was just water, water and grass because nothing else would grow here. So this is one of our chinampas. Here's one of the squash that's starting that looks like a Queensland blue. What else we got? As we come around the outside here, Got a couple more in there. That looks like a, a butternut, but a kind of a hybrid butternut with something else. And there's, that looks like some kind of acorn squash beside it. Here's another, what looks like a type of acorn squash. Going really well. Here is what might just be an Atlantic giant, or maybe it's a hybrid between a rouge vif des temps and something else, because I know the rouge vif starts yellow like that. So here's where the food that you eat can also be decor. Here we have a little mini garden right beside our pond. And I had spoken to you about it before when everything was really small. Now I'd like to show you now that everything's almost reached full size. So we have the, the millet here down below in the middle that is starting to get its, its, uh, its grain here. It's quite beautiful. It's going to be yellow. And so it's right here. This is about its height. And then behind it and above we have, this is a type of sorghum called coral sorghum. And uh, the stems are also can be used as like sugar cane. It's a type of sugar cane. And, uh, and, so, and, and so it's flowering above. And these, these flower heads are going to become red, a burgundy red. And then on either end, framing the, the millet on this end. And over here on this end, we have some beautiful red uh, amaranth. Now the flowers are very small right now. But they're going to be really, really big and intense, full of thousands of thousands and thousands of seeds. And of course, all of this, the amaranth, the millet, and the cross arm is, is grain, delicious, nutritious grain. And on top of that, the amaranth, the leaves, can also be eaten just like spinach. Beautiful, edible decor, landscaping decor. This is one of those wow moments. This uh, bean vine here, pole bean vine, I got to get another uh, another pole for because it's getting heavy. It's self-seeded. I did not plant any beans here. I did not even have beans on me here in the springtime. But what I did have was beans growing off of some sorghum here last year. And so some of them stayed there all winter, the beans, the, the, the beans, the dried beans. I didn't pick them all. I just wanted to leave it there. I was curious. 
and uh, but he stayed there all winter and I don't know if they fell in the early spring or in the late spring all I know is bean sprouts or the seeds themselves are very it's okay when they're dry they can handle being like in very cold they can be out in minus you know below zero weather temporarily anyways when they're dry but as soon as they get wet rained on whatever and it goes down below zero and here it goes down to minus 20 in the winter well that kills them and uh and for sure the bean sprouts if they start growing in the cold it kills them well somehow these stayed here all winter and somehow they maybe they fell at just the right time and they self-seeded and now we've got a whole bunch of beautiful purple pole beans these are my favorites because they produce lots and the dried beans are really nice too i'm gonna go get another uh, another pole for this to hold it up bon appetit mm. yeah, i got a pole now yeah, I see some. there we are all right now i'm just gonna wrap some of this vine around this pole Gently, don't want to break the vine. Although if I break the vine, no big deal. It'll just sprout some more branches along the leaf nodes. So there we go. That ought to hold up a little bit better. Great having, you know, not having even planted it. Love it when stuff grows on its own because that's the idea of the food forest. Okay. Oh, where are you? Where are you? Hold on. <laughs> so, I, I'm curious to see how some of our early potatoes are doing, but before I can do that, I gotta get rid of some of this wild lettuce so I can film. Meter, six foot long wild lettuce stalk to pull down. There we go. Now you can see. Now you can see uh, the area that I put that I put straw on the other day. So those were the ones that that fell over first. So I'm gonna just reach in there and see what's going on. But before I do that, I'm gonna show you something. I've shown you the flowers before. Well, this is what the flowers give you. I'm gonna pull this off. I don't really need these. Not all of them, anyway. Look at this. <laughs> what do they look like? Look like cherry tomatoes. These are pumpkin fruit. Yeah, they're not edible though. And uh, well, these aren't ripe either, but even when they're ripe, they're not edible, even though they smell really sweet when they're ripe. Um, but you don't eat them. They're not edible. Uh, however, like any fruit, they've got seeds inside. Now these ones I've picked green, so I'm not gonna keep these for the seeds gonna throw them back in the garden and and well they'll uh, they'll maybe ripen in the garden and the seeds will eventually regrow next year um, but maybe later in the season I will collect some ripe ones we'll see but what's interesting about the seeds you get from a potato fruit is you're gonna get an original potato out of this because have you ever wondered you know I mean the potatoes we grow we buy potatoes we plant them and we grow them and what you end up getting is exactly the same potato. You know, sort of like which, you know, I guess it's sort of like a clone. Uh, but these, well, these are from pollination. And so who knows which other potato flower that helped pollinate the, these flowers that made these, that made these potatoes. And so you get unique potatoes. And you know what? Rather than throwing this back in the garden, I'm going to keep these and see if they ripen on their own having already picked them okay so let's get started doing some a little bit of a little bit of uh, potato harvest here just a few just a few for some meals in july just want to see how they're doing because we're all out of last year's potatoes we ran out a few weeks ago I don't remember exactly when it was all right Try not to step on any plants here, and I'm just going to try and harvest closer to where I'm kneeling here. Okay, I hope you can see a little better now. 
Here's one of the plants that's fallen over. So I'm just gonna pull this up a little. See what's going on here. Looks like this plant. Okay. Alright. Here we are. First potato of the season. I'm just gonna rebury this vine that I pulled. Nice. Look at that. I don't know if you can see me. I'm just going to dig up. I don't know if you can see all these, but I'm digging up a bunch of potatoes. Let me just move over here. Once again, I'm doing this with my hands. And I'm trying not to pull the plants. I pulled the one because it didn't look too healthy anyway. Yeah, I'm going to rebury the healthy part of it so that it creates more... Uh, more vines on the branch, more roots, and more potatoes. And what I'm doing here is I'm pulling potatoes out from under some of these other plants that fell over. So that way they can keep growing. Now these are pretty big for early potatoes. And if they're, and if they're small like this, well, I'm just gonna throw that back in. It's not going to grow anymore this year, but it'll be there for next year. Trying not to disturb too much soil. Just a little section. You know, about three feet by three feet, not even. Two feet by two feet. So, let's show you what I got so far in here. So I got Two here, four, six, eight, ten. I have no idea if you can see this. It's the camera's in the sun. Twelve, sixteen, these are four little ones. Eighteen. green one there that I just reburied. So yeah, I'm doing this with my hand because I don't want to you know, break any of these potatoes. And if they're more deeper, well that's fine. 18, 19, 20. I got almost enough here for now. Got a couple potato vines here that I pulled. I'm just going to bury them in all this loose earth. They've got some little tiny potatoes on them still. Some of them are a little decomposed. That's fine too. Just bury these vines. We'll go again. And then I'll probably throw some, some, some more straw on top of this area. Because I just saw a potato that a little potato that wasn't finished growing that was going green. So another potato. This was I also decided to do this area first because of all the wild lettuce. I wanted to pull that. Here we go. Put some of this straw back, but I'm gonna probably go get some more straw. Cover this whole area here. these others yeah, doing good looking underneath the straw all right good okay there we go Little two five two foot by two foot area 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters roughly and I didn't dig deep very deep down either didn't want to disturb the soil too much I'm going to use some of this wild lettuce to cover up my potatoes in my bucket. Because they're not going in yet. I am going to put the bucket in the shade, but I just want a extra protection from the sun to cover them up. I just laid some more straw, and the straw was 
decomposing so it's a little bit slimy so i don't really like that feeling on my arms so i'm just i've got a manitoba maple growing in the garden here that i certainly don't need so i'm just using the leaves to clean my arms off and uh, and then i'm just dropping those leaves on top of the straw that i just laid our first pump our first plum picked it a little bit green, but it's delicious. This one on the other hand is sweet. I came out to get a thinning of beets, thin out the beets a little because they're so thickly grown. Got more than a, a lot more than a thinning here. These beets are beautiful. And beside every single one of these big ones, there were at least two other little ones still growing, like right stuck to them. And so it's like I didn't pick any out of the garden. Still so many more to come. You see those two, those there? Stuck to the big one. No, I didn't pull it right. I pulled them all out. A big beet and a couple small ones. So now I'm going to try and pick this big one without picking the small ones. So I just put my thumb on the small ones and my finger and pull the big one without disturbing the small ones. I'm going to wrap them, give you the wash beets in this damp cloth and put them in the fridge and they'll stay like that. They'll be able to stay for a few weeks in the fridge at least like that in the damp cloth. Might have to check the damp cloth every once in a while make sure it hasn't dried. 30 beats here. Outdoor vegetable rinse station set up to one of our hose faucets before bringing it into the kitchen. And the water that uh, comes out goes into these watering cans that we can then use to water the gardens. Basil, watermelon, and peppers seem to be working really well together because none of these plants take up a huge amount of space. Watermelon all, all by itself, the vines are very narrow. Peppers aren't huge plants and basil doesn't take up a whole lot of space. So each of these plants fills in the space of each other and the, uh, the watermelon climbs up the basil nicely without actually knocking it over. It's really, really nice. I'm really, really liking this combination. In the back, there's some okra. But it's just beautiful too. Like I've just harvested with all this little bucket full of oil. A bunch of hard basil here I've just harvested. These ones, just the tops of these ones. I haven't done that one yet. And I haven't done this one, but I'm about to do this one over here. You can see that watermelon leaf, those watermelon leaves coming up through the basil. It's really, really nice. And I've already gotten several harvests of basils here, here. So the watermelon doesn't shade out the basil. So it's really nice, really doing well. another plant that I could recommend for its beauty and also the fact that it's going to give you a vegetable to eat. This is the bloom of an okra plant. And the plant itself, you can see the stems are beautiful red. Now you've also got okras that are green. This is the okra that's just beginning to form here. This is a sort of a, a stubby type of okra that is green and red. And the plant is beautiful. The leaves are interesting. Green with red veins. 
very beautiful plant. We've got it here in this uh, flower garden with some cosmos, some tomatoes, some beans, some chipiche, which is going to, which is, which is flowering, some blanket flower, lavender, which is the sort of the key species in this little garden, some tithonia, which, uh, which has given one flower, but it's going to start flowering a lot more. Here's some more okra and some more okra right here. Very beautiful plant. Here's another, another bloom just about to open. And on the other side of the garden, I'm going to show you one of the other types of okra that, uh, the fruit. We have a bunch of lavender that we just put in this year, but while it gets established, we put in all sorts of other stuff. Got some, some, uh, uh what is this, uh, ground cherry. This is just regular run of the mill, uh, gro seeded ground cherry but we've got some na native ground cherry in here too. Here's some more okra, and here is some, this is a burgundy okra that is g giving its fruit right now. And this is just about ready. This is about as long as my finger, maybe a little shorter, and it's just about ready to be picked. These things can grow twice as long and twice as thick, but when they get too big, they get a little hard. Magali doesn't like them when they're, they become really hard and woody. So I like to pick them while they're still tender. And one last thing to show you in here. This is some native ground cherry. I threw some, uh, some fruit in here last fall and it's growing. I'm really happy about that. So I hope you liked the video. I hope you found it useful. And if you liked it and you found it useful, then Share it with your friends. And if you haven't done so yet, then subscribe. Support our channel just through subscribing. And then maybe you can watch some more videos. Have a great week. I know we're going to be having a lot of fun this week with our wedding. And we will see you next time.